and educate people on the version. If you're looking at um, Intramuros from the perspective of history, it's one place where you could actually see the history of the Philippines uh, as it unfolded. Um, I see that um, Intramuros is a, an area which can embody the concept of reuse in urban planning. So just think of old structures being utilized in a modern sense. I think the challenge for us in IA is how can we recreate the former ambience so that people can relive history um, through intramuros. And then that's where uh, it becomes a site where we can educate people on the version of history according to the Filipinos. So I am Roberto Alabado III and uh, currently I'm the Assistant Secretary for Tourism Development Planning and it's fantastic to have an urban area, an old urban area where in the um, maybe in our generation we can see this transformed into a, or a more developed society where poverty will no longer exist within the walls of Intramuros. Ano ko po sa Intramuros isang ano, isang kasaysayang lugar. Kasi dito, dito nagkaroon ng ano, tigman. Hindi nyo natutunan ko sa eskwelahan. Uh, sa akin sir, ang laki po ng may tulong ng eskwela talaga kasi nung Nung, ano, nung una po na hindi pa ako nakapasok dito, high school graduate lang ako, nahihirapan ako maghanap ng trabaho. So nung nakita ko na mag-opening sila na ano, kailangan nila na ng trainees, so pumasok ako yun. Tapos pagka-graduate ko, binigyan nila ako ng opportunity na magtrabaho sa mga heritage site. Uh, ako po si Christian Edward Aguirre. Bali, ano po, instructor po ako ngayon ng ano, Masonry Workshop dito sa Eskwela Talia. Ang laki ng ano, tulong, unang-una doon sa paninirahan. Uh, nagkaroon, mayroon kami matitiraan sa loob. Dito ako nakatira. Sana po mas tumibay pa ang komunidad dito sa loob. Tira ako sa Basco Street, Intramuros, Manila. Doon ako nagkaroon ng uh, misip. Doon ako, dito ako nakita, ano, dito ako lumaki. Ginagawa ko dito sa 
Eskwela Talero sa trabaho ko. Isa ako sa mga heritage protector na isa akong mason. Ito ako yung Eskwela Talero na nagtitrain sila ng mga out of school dito. May kahit na high school graduate lang uh, pinasok ko. Tinitrain nila hanggang sa mahasa as kinukuha din nila as worker din. Ako si Edsel Paul Mauhay ha. Uh, Kumutulong para maibalik yung ganda ng drum rolls. Para mas maibaganda yung drum rolls para sa lahat. Escuela Talier, ito yung nagbigay sa akin ng, ano, pangalawang, ng pangalawang pagkakataon na ayusin lahat. Tinutulungan kami para ma-develop yung mga skills namin para magkaroon kami ng kakayahan na gumawa ng sarili rin naming pagkakakitaan. Yung natapos ko dito ay carpentry and woodworks tsaka painting and finishing. Uh, ako si Romel Rivera. Graduate ako ng Escuela Talier ng Batch 7. May improve siguro yung, yung pagkikipag-connecta ng mismong intramuros administration sa community. Yung mas mapal, ano pa, mas mapatibay pa. Pag, pag, pagdadagdag pa sa mga pwedeng magamit na parte ng intramuros. Yung trabaho ng mama ko kasi dito sa San Agustin Church. Parish coordinator siya, kaya ano pa lang yun, hindi pa ako pinapanganak, nandun na siya. Intramuros, ano na sa akin to, parang mahal ko yung lugar na yun, kasi dito na ako, na, dito ako pinanganak eh. Ito, ayun na yung pinakabahay ko, hindi lang yung bahay na tinutulugan ko sa loob. Yung mismong intramuros, siya na yung pinakabahay ko, yung mismong pader. Safe pa ako pag nasa loob. For me, Intramuros is a place of history. Um, it is a cultural and creative hub, and um, it brings so much pride and joy to the 5th District as well. If I could describe Intramuros in one word, it's mesmerizing because Walking along or walking around, it gives you a sense of history and makes you step into a whole new world that is so different from what you see outside the walls of Intramuros. My fondest memories of Intramuros, I would say, was when I was a little girl because I also grew up here in the 5th district and as a little girl, I would come to Intramuros with my parents, I would tag along, I would ride 
the Calesa, I would go around in Chamorros, Port Santiago, and I would remember also coming to Barbaras to eat with my dad. Hi, my name is Crystal Bagat Singh. I am currently the Congresswoman of the 5th District of Manila, where Intramuros is located. One of my advocacies is um, about culture, preserving culture, and uh, one of the things that I also do as a Congresswoman is make legislation, and I also have a constituency inside Intramuros. I think it's very important because when you say Metro Manila, there is really no place to go to for a cultural experience or for a historical experience. And there's really no other place like Intramuros. It's, it's, a, it's an original. There's nothing like it. If you want to have a feel of how it was to live during the Spanish times, this is where you go. I wish that everybody would work together to keep Intramuros the way it is, but make it better, preserve it better. Intramuros is very important to us because of the lessons in heritage and history. Siguro in one line no, ng objective ng Bahay Chinoy, establish our rightful place in the Philippine sun. Nag, uh, bukas ito sa public noong 1999, no, uh, inilalarawan nito ang bahagi at ang impact ng mga Chinese Filipinos in all aspects of Philippine life. I wish that the Bahay Chinoy can be recognized in the whole Intramuros and the whole Philippine society. I wish all the visitors, the audience, regardless of race, regardless of origin, regardless of your religion, can be recognized as part of this nation and as part of this uh, nation building and the history of the Philippines. Ako po si Teresita Angsi, founding president ng Kaisa Para sa Kaunlaran, at ngayon ay executive trustee ng Kaisa Heritage Foundation na nagmamanage sa Bahay Chinoy Museum of the Chinese in Philippine Life. For me, Intramuros is our past, present, and our future. And because of that, it is very important in our lives. We must be involved and engaged in Intramuros and we as citizens must do everything to keep it alive, to keep it vibrant because it is the archive of our history. It is the archive of who we are as a people. Well, I'm Olivia Limpeao. I'm the president and CEO of Distillery Limtuaco and the fifth generation master blender and distiller of the oldest distillery in the Philippines. So our company was established in 1852 and it was our founder is uh, Don Bonifacio Lim Traco who came from China, Fujian, China, and he introduced to the Philippines this product called Shok Hok Tong, which eventually became the generic term uh, for Chinese medicinal wine, Shok Tong. And so uh, we are very much part of the history of the Philippines through our liquor making with 167 years of history and legacy that we have shared with this country. Well, Intramuros is very important because this was really the seat of um, governmental power and uh, trade 
culture, religion, and we're very proud to be part of Intramuros now through our museum. While our role in Intramuros is really to provide another tourist spot, you know, another tourist spot where through our museum, tourists can learn more about our country, about our products, about our industry. And uh, we're very proud to be given that opportunity to participate, you know, in promoting culture through food. Well, I would really love that Intramuros would be teeming with tourists, with young people working in this place, celebrating our history and our culture and sharing it with the rest of the world. Similar to what other countries are doing, for instance, like in Tallinn, Estonia, where they have a medieval, medieval walled city. I wish uh, our Intramuros would be not just like that, but maybe even better, you know? So it would be um, really a living walled city of the past, the present, and the future. Ang mga binibenta ko po pagkain na ulam, adobo, sinigang, kaldereta, pork chop, fried chicken, may mga gulay, pakbe, tsaka chop soy. Nakaramihan ako makain sa akin, nagtrabaho sa Mapua, mga empleyado. Tapos, estudyante rin ng Mapua, Lyceum, Manila High. Ayun po, nakakatulong ng tindahan po namin sa Intramuros, lalo na po ang sana may malaking bagay po sa mga estudyante at mga empleyado sa Intramuros na nagtatrabaho kasi uh, pangmasa po ang presyo. 40 years na po ako nakatira sa Intramuros, naranasan na namin yung hirap, baha. <laughs> Para sa amin, ang intramuros, malaking bagay kasi dito nabuhay mga anak ko, dito ako nagpalaki ng mga anak ko, dito, dito ko kinuha yung pampalaki ng mga anak ko, maaral. Kaya ang intramuros, malaking bagay sa amin. Dito na rin nag-aaral ng mga anak ko ng high school, elementary sa Quiapo, Mabini, sa high school sa Manila High School, sa intramuros. Ako, ako po si Edna Apable. Merong isang karindirya sa Intramuros. Ang ginagawa ko po, namamalengke sa magaling araw, may nagluluto, nagtitinda. Ang pangarap ko po sa Intramuros, sana huwag kami mawala at habang buhay kami makapaghanap buhay sa Intramuros. So, naging special sa akin yung Intramuros dahil uh, dito rin ako nakatira. So, dito na rin ako uh, kumuku uh, kumukuha para sa hanap na buhay namin. And then, ang Intramuros din para sa akin is parang isang tahanan na rin para sa akin.
So ang role ko dito sa Intramuros ay parang uh, tayo naging nag-a-attract or nagpapa sa mga turista dito sa loob ng Intramuros para kahit pa paano makita rin nila yung kagandahan ng Intramuros. Ako nga pala si Valentino Mejia, isang e-trike driver dito sa Intramuros. So ang nakikita ko sa future ng Intramuros is uh, lalawak pa yung Uh, ating turismo dito sa loob ng Intramuros and then talaga makikilala ang Intramuros sa buong Pilipinas hindi lang sa buong Pilipinas sa buong mundo Ang Intramuros isa sa pinakamahalagang lugar dito sa buong Pilipinas ito ay isa sa pinaka historical place ay naitutulong ng isang kutsero ay, ay may turo sa mga bawat na mga masyal kung anong mahalagang lugar dito sa Intramuros. Ang mga rule ng mga kutsero ay kailangan uh, panatili, malinis ang lugar apos sa uh, mag-inuformi at sunod, sundin ang mga alituntunin ng Intramuros. Dito sa Intramuros, sana uh, sa araw o bawat sa linggo, bigyan nila ng uh, mga libre na mga lugar para lalong pasyalan ng mga namamasyal dito sa Intramuros. Yung iba kasi uh, namamasyal dito, hindi nakakapasok sa mga lugar-lugar kasi may mga bayan. Ako pala si Romeo M. Javier bilang isang kutsero at bilang isang tour guide sa Intramuros. Dito rin ako nabubuhay at nabubuhay ang aming pamilya. Kaya malaking malaking tulong ang Intramuros sa buhay ng bawat isang kutsero din.
I'm gonna click the record button now. Okay. Welcome everybody to tonight's episode of the Intermors Learning Session. This is uh, Rancho Arcelia and welcome. But our topic for today is about the, the General Ar uh, Douglas MacArthur and uh, we have some very distinguished uh, guests today. So, but before we start, I'd like to read first some house rules. So if you'd like to ask questions, you may send it to the Q&A button. It is found in the lower portion of the screen. So that is if you're viewing via Zoom. If you're viewing via Facebook, you may send in your questions in the comment section below. Only those who have successfully registered and viewed in Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate. A feedback form will be emailed to you after the session and the, certifi the certificate will be sent within a week. Note that this webinar is recorded. Ensure that your audio is okay, wear your reliable set of headphones, and most importantly, get yourself comfortable and enjoy. Now, uh, uh, I'd like to call on the administrator of Intamuros to formally introduce our speakers for tonight. Administrator. Good day, everyone, wherever in the world you are watching this. Um, this is our, one of the most uh, participated uh, sessions of, uh, since we started the Intramuros Learning Sessions a few months ago. And we, when we decided to start the Intramuros Learning Sessions, we deliberately decided that um, part of the discussions or part of the regular topics should be on the Second World War because Intramuros, uh, the significant uh, part in terms of the Second World War in the Philippines. And there can be no full discussion of the Second World War if we are not going to uh, discuss as well um, a significant and uh, one of the most polarizing figures in the Second World War. And that's General Douglas MacArthur. So we are fortunate that for uh, this evening's or this uh, today's session, special one, we will have three uh, members of the panel who will be speaking to us regarding, um, the, uh, regarding General MacArthur. So I would like to introduce the three members of our panel. We'll start off with Ms. Desiree Benepayo, who incidentally is also celebrating her birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ms. Des is a writer and a film producer, and actually she's the author of the best-selling book, Honor the Legacy of Abad Santos, and which has won a um, National uh, Book Award as well last year. Thank you, Ms. Des, for doing this again with, uh, with the Intramuros administration. Thank you, Attorney G. It's a pleasure. Thank you. The other member of the panel is uh, this distinguished and, and always a sought-after speaker regarding the Second World War, no other than Professor Ricardo Jose, who is a professor of history at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. I will not dwell too much on the accolades and the contributions that, that Dr. Jose has already uh, significantly established for himself. Because uh, if there's any, if there are personalities who are more expert or considered to be experts on the Second World War, we have the two of two of them with us tonight. And lastly, I would like to introduce to you a special guest, mm -hmm. Mr. James Sobel. He's an archivist based in Virginia and is currently the director and archivist of the MacArthur Memorial Library and Museum. Um, when we had uh, James Scott. A few week, a few months ago, um, we thought that was the height already of the discussions. But now we are fortunate that we have another distinguished member of the panel with us who will be uh, giving his insights, and no better expert on that than Mr. James Sobel. So thank you, everyone, for um, agreeing to participate in tonight's uh, discussion, and we look forward to the conversation. Okay, thank you, Administrator. Uh, now, I'd like to remind uh, everyone that this session can only be viewed 
via Zoom and via our official Facebook page. Now, if you are viewing this outside of any other platforms that are not official, kindly report them to us, especially if these are monetized so that we can undertake the necessary action. So I repeat, the broadcasting of this session outside our official platforms are not allowed. So uh, I'd like to call on Ms. Des, our guest host for today. So I'd like to turn over the screen to Ms. Des for tonight. So Ms. Des. Good evening, Rancho. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to episode 28 of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. And this is our fourth episode on the topic of World War II. For tonight, uh, we would like to dedicate our program to Dr. Benito Legarda, eminent historian, gifted writer, and the pillar of Philippine World War II history studies, who passed away last August 26. Let us pause for a brief moment of silence in memory of our beloved Dr. Benito Legarda. This week marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. On September 2, 1945, Japan signed the Instrument of Surrender to the Allies on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The following day, September 3, General Yamashita and Vice Admiral Okochi signed the Instrument of Surrender in Baguio City, surrendering all Japanese Imperial forces in the Philippines, thus formally ending the war. As part of its virtual commemoration, the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk, Virginia, worked with friends and partners to create this compilation of General MacArthur's speech during the surrender ceremony on the USS Missouri. Let us now watch this short video presentation. Sorry, the audio was off. Can I restart? Rewind, rewind. <laughs> All right, here it goes. Allied powers. I announce it, my firm purpose 
the tradition of the countries I represent, to proceed in the discharge of my responsibilities with justice and tolerance. While taking all necessary dispositions to ensure the terms of surrender are fully, properly, and faithfully complied with. And now invite representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government. And the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender that the places indicated. Mr. comes to the surrender table. Mr. Kim comes to the surrender table. General Yoshijiro Mitsu of the Imperial General Staff signs for the Japanese Army. General MacArthur signs as Supreme Allied Commander for the forces of the United States itself. Admiral Chester Niven signs. General Su Yong Chang, Chief of Military Operations for the Chinese National Council, signs for China. Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, Commander of the British Pacific Fleet for the United Kingdom. Lieutenant General Kunza Nikolaevich Derevyanko for Soviet Russia. General Sir Thomas Blaney for Australia. General Lawrence Moore Cosgrave for Canada. General Jacques Leclerc, hero of Africa and Paris for France. Admiral C. E. L. Helfrich for the Netherlands. Air Vice Marshal L. M. Isen for New Zealand. Thank you. So that was a short video made by the MacArthur Memorial. For those who want to watch it fully, I know we have some connectivity problems a while ago. You can go to either the website or the Facebook page of MacArthur Memorial for the full video. And as we can see, the Gen General MacArthur was a central um, character during the Pacific War. Douglas MacArthur was destined to be a soldier. Born in 1880 at Arsenal Barracks in Little Rock, Arkansas, MacArthur, with his flair for dramatics, always said that his first recollection was that of a bugle call. His father, General Arthur MacArthur, was the biggest influence in Douglas's life. And so, in 1899, he entered the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he excelled in sports and graduated top of his class with one of the best academic records in the history of the academy. He was in his element in the battlefield, called Bravest of the Brave by his men, and was highly decorated during the First World War. Not for long, he was back at West Point, this time as its superintendent. And at the age of 50, MacArthur became the youngest chief of staff of the United States Army. MacArthur's destiny would be so intertwined with that of the Philippines. Upon graduating from West Point in 1903, his first assignment was in the Philippines with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Philippines charmed me, MacArthur said, and fastened me with a grip that has never relaxed, and thus started his long relationship with the Philippines, with two more tours of duty in the 1920s and as military advisor of the Commonwealth in 1935. Tonight we shall endeavor to present this great military commander, his defeats and his victories, his flaws and his most laudable qualities that made him one of the most famous yet most misunderstood personalities in history. And we're fortunate to be joined by two experts, Professor Ricardo Jose of the UP Department of History in Diliman, and James Zobel, Director and Archivist of the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk, Virginia. So, Dr. Jose, I'll give the floor to you. Hey, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, viewers, or good morning, uh, wherever in the world you are, whatever time zone it is. Welcome to the program. So uh, we are commemorating today and in the last few days the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. 
But before we get into that and find out what happened uh, 75 years ago, we have to go back to the beginning. And since we're talking about MacArthur, we look, we'll look into MacArthur's relationship with the Philippines, particularly before the war. Because uh, just the other night I watched the movie MacArthur, uh, it was my third or fourth time. And that movie starts with MacArthur on Corregidor. It doesn't go into the background of how he got there and what, why the war started. So we'll start from the beginning. And the task assigned to me was to talk about the uh, MacArthur's role during the Commonwealth years and up till the period he became the commanding general of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East. So in 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act was passed. It was, a ten, it, it was supposed to begin a 10-year transition period which would prepare the Philippines for independence. That period would be from 1935 to 1946. This would mean that a constitution would have to be framed that would start in 1934 and into 1935. That would be the 1935 constitution, which we still have traces of in today's constitution. And from that 1935 constitution, based on that, would be, would be uh, held the 1935, con uh, 1935 election, in which the representatives of the National Assembly and the top officers of the Commonwealth would be elected. Of course, we know that Quezon was elected president and the vice president was Sergio Osmeña. The Commonwealth was inaugurated on November, in November 1935 in very colorful uh, ceremonies. So uh, Roosevelt signed the Tidings McDuffie Act in 1934. And here we can see two Filipinos behind him. One of them is uh, President Ke he, well, At this time, he was Senate President, not yet President of the Philippine Commonwealth. He's behind Roosevelt. And next to him is uh, El Pidio Quirino. The tall guy to the right is, uh, is uh, M Tidings, Senator M Tidings, who was co-author of the act. And so Roosevelt is signing the act at this particular point. It was a very high point in Philippine-American relations and a very high point in Philippine history because now the Philippine, Philippines' road to independence would be very clear. And in 1935, in November 1935, the Philippine Commonwealth would be inaugurated in very colorful ceremonies. Here's a rather blurred picture of the ceremonies in front of the then National Legislative Building, which is today the National Museum. And we'd see that as part of the terms of the Commonwealth, the Philippines was not yet independent. We were still an American colony. The American flag had to fly together with the Philippine flag. The Philippine flag could not fly alone. But it's during this particular ceremony that Quezon would take his oath of office as president and would begin the terms of the Philippine Commonwealth. Now, even before Quezon was elected president, Quezon foresaw the need for national defense. In fact, when he was in Washington, D.C., during the signing of the Tidings McDuffie Act, Quezon made it a point to see, uh, to see MacArthur. And this is before he was president, before the election, before e even before the Commonwealth Constitution was approved. But I guess Quezon was so sure of being elected that he went and approached MacArthur. MacArthur was then chief of staff of the U.S. Army the highest position of any possible, of any uh, military officer in the U.S. Army at that particular time. MacArthur, uh, faced with Quezon's offer to become military advisor to the Commonwealth that had not yet been inaugurated, uh, accepted the offer, but under certain conditions. In fact, the question that Quezon asked MacArthur was, do you think the Philippines can be defended? And MacArthur very quickly said, I don't think the Philippines can be defended. I know the Philippines can be defended, provided you give enough money and lay out uh, enough effort to prepare the plans, uh, to carry out the plans that I will work out with. So from that point on, MacArthur began to plan the war plans, the defense plans of the Philippines. And for Quezon, this is Quezon before he became president, very young, very uh, uh, still very vibrant, uh, before, the, before the responsibilities of the presidency came on to him. But uh, Quezon had a lot to gain because he, as incoming president, would be getting the services of no less than the highest ranking officer in the United States, the chief of staff. And 
get him under his employ. Now, for someone in a colonial system, this was indeed something important. MacArthur, on the other hand, that's him on the right as chief of staff with his military regalia, MacArthur, on the other hand, uh, had no way up anymore. He had reached the pinnacle of the uh, success of a military officer in the United States, the chief of staff, and any position he would take after this would be a step down. So accepting the offer of Quezon would be a step outwards, but also an, quite an adventurous step because he would be able to design his own army and become the head of that particular army. So MacArthur felt he could defend the Philippines, provided the proper amount of money was allotted. And he drew up the main outlines of his plan while he assigned it to his staff. He, MacArthur and his staff arrived in the Philippines before the Commonwealth was inaugurated. The Commonwealth was inaugurated in November, and MacArthur and his staff arrived in October. Here they are arriving freshly, uh, fresh off the ship that took them in Pier 7. Uh, MacArthur is using civilian clothes rather than in, he's not in military uniform. This is of interest because he was still in the active service of the U.S. Army at this point, but he chose to, and his staff also chose to wear civilian clothes. Uh, that's Eisenhower to his left. Uh, Eisenhower was the uh, number one framer of the staff together with another major, major org. So MacArthur and his staff arrived just a few weeks before the inauguration while still in active military service. Now, the National Defense Act was quickly framed. In fact, once the Philippine National Assembly sat, it immediately was given the draft of the National Defense Act. And eventually that act became Commonwealth Act No. 1, which was signed into law by President Quezon on December 21, 1935. Uh, that's interesting to note because the first act of the Philippine Assembly in 1907 was one that allotted funds for education. The first act of the Commonwealth government was the National Defense Act. This act is still basically in force even today with, uh, with certain changes through the years. The act allotted 16 million pesos a year. Uh, that's not very large by today's uh, inter terms of today's numbers, but 16 million pesos at that time was a lot of money. And to give it some comparison, that was 20% of the Philippine national budget. That meant the other agencies getting money from the budget, education, public works, etc., would now have to share with the new national defense system. The national defense plan was really framed basically by Major Dwight D. Eisenhower, who became president in the 1950s, and Major James Ord. It called for gradual expansion and was meant to deter any prospective enemy nation, but relying on the neutrality clause that was there in the Philippine Constitution. So it was supposed to be a threat. Uh, it was supposed to threaten any possible invader, but also present external and internal security, actual security. The Philippine army was thus created as a result of the National Defense Act. It was supposed to consist of a small regular force with a large reserve. The Philippine Military Academy was established on the uh, framework of the then existing Philippine Constabulary Academy. The basic plan was to train two groups of people, from uh, men from all over the Philippines, 20,000 each in two groups, that would be 40,000 a year, mass training. And after that, they would become reservists, subject to call at any time that they might be needed. The U.S. would provide weapons and local equipment would be provided or, or manufactured as best as possible. Aside from infantry, the ground forces, uh, the Air Corps and offshore patrol were also considered by MacArthur, although they would both have late starts. In order to provide officers for the Army, a reserve officer training corps was instituted in college and pre-military training was started in high school. So this would also mean that the military system would go into the colleges and into the high schools as well. The plan was to create an army that would be a nationwide army and that ideally it would be mobile. It would be able to move from one point to another, not on fixed positions. So important would be transportation and roads. Uh, Camp Murphy was supposed to be the main base 
for the Philippine Army. The major part of training would be developed in Camp Murphy, which is now Camp Aguinaldo today. And the training programs were first tested here before they were tested in the various provinces. Uh, we can see here that uh, already the principles of local manufacturing and weapons from the United States are shown here. The weapons they're carrying, the rifles, are American-made weapons. They were the cheapest at the time, World War I uh, equipment, World War I rifles. But almost everything else that could be manufactured here was manufactured in the Philippines. That included the belts, that included the shoes, that included the hats. Uh, in the lower photo, you'll see that they're wearing a, sp a special kind of helmet, not steel, but this is made out of coconut fiber or at that time it was called Ginit. So it helped also the local coconut industry. Incidentally, that building in Camp Aguinaldo is still there. That, uh, that's one of the only buildings left inside Camp Aguinaldo. But again, notice the American and Philippine flags flying together, indicative of the fact that we were still in a col colonial status. Now, at that time, okay, the, the equipment was uh, mass produced as mu much as possible in the Philippines, but the military academy, Philippine military academy, uh, would parade whenever possible. And here is uh, one of their parades, one of the Commonwealth anniversaries just before the war. Uh, this replaced again the Philippine Constabulary Academy, and was now the uh, curriculum was revised so that one would be really a purely military curriculum. The first class to graduate. Under the purely military curriculum, however, would only graduate in 1940. And so, therefore, by the time the war started, we only had class of 1940 and 1941. Class of 1942 would be given battlefield commissions because although they technically did not graduate officially, they graduated in the battlefields of the Philippines. So here again, the, West, the Philippine Milita Military Academy, but wearing very uh, West Point-inspired uniforms. Again, you see the American and Philippine flags flying, and you see the Manila Hotel behind. So the country was divided into 10 military districts based on population. So the, uh, <clears throat> thus, uh, this is a map uh, that was made during the war, but it shows the 10 military districts that, were, uh, that the Philippines was divided into at that time. Uh, since it was divided by population, it meant that the districts that had the most population would have the smallest areas to cover. And the districts that had the least, the smallest population would actually have uh, the largest area to cover. See, Mindanao in the south uh, had the smallest population in the whole area, and that was just one military district. Luzon, which had a higher population, had five military districts, and the Visayas was divided into four. So this provided problems because, in fact, was Mindanao then less important since it was only one military district? But that would lead to serious consequences later. Now, as the plans were going on and as the plans were being carried out, MacArthur held his office in number one, Calia Victoria, in Intramuros. This is what it looked like just before the war. Uh, the, it was called the House on the Wall, and MacArthur's headquarters was there. This is also MacArthur's car before the war. Uh, the stairs is still there, incidentally, but if you go to the same place today, there are several bullet holes from the Battle of Manila. But it had a very good view of the sunken gardens in front of it, and it had a very strategic position in Intramuros. Uh, here in number one, Calia Victoria, MacArthur held office and kept track of developments. Uh, here he is MacArthur inside his office, American flag behind, on the right side unseen is the Philippine flag, studying reports and uh, looking at papers that he would have to sign. Uh, to his right is uh, Major Eisenhower, who was his aide, and one of the major planners of the defense plan. Uh, across the sunken garden from MacArthur's office, and MacArthur could see this every day, was the Manila Hotel, where MacArthur lived. Uh, in fact, one of the things that MacArthur had asked Quezon when he took the job, uh, when he decided to take the job, was to have adequate living quarters, something like Malacanang Palace. 
And Quezon said that Quezon could not give up Malacanang Palace because that was for the Philippine president. So they decided on the penthouse uh, of the Manila Hotel, and that was arranged for MacArthur to live in. It was a very fantastic suite overlooking Manila Bay and Bataan and Corredor. Indeed, it is the most luxurious suite in Manila Hotel even today. It is still open if you want to rent it. I think it's something like 1 million pesos a night or something like that. So it's a very, uh, it's a prime property and MacArthur was there. Well, when uh, MacArthur came, he and Quezon were extremely close. They were very, very close. In fact, not only were they close professionally, not only were they close in, in personal friendships, but they also became compadres. So this is one of the pre-war pictures where uh, MacArthur and Quezon are very close to each other. Compadres in the sense that when Quezon's son was born, MacArthur became the godfather. And as we shall see later, Quezon would become the godfather or the godfather of MacArthur's son. Uh, Quezon made MacArthur a field marshal of the Phil Philippine army very early on, even though the Philippine army did not yet exist except on paper. MacArthur had brought his mother to live with him. Uh, but his mother, as we know, was very close to him, and some would call him a mother's boy even. But while in Manila Hotel, Mrs. MacArthur passed away due to natural causes. Uh, due to nat natural causes, MacArthur, in his travels, met a bubbly, vivacious lady, Jean Faircloth, and they soon got married. Soon, MacArthur had a son, Arthur, and this is uh, Quezon became the godfather of his son. So this picture was taken in the MacArthur suite just before the war. Jean Faircloth, now Mrs. Now Mrs. MacArthur, and the son. So they would be very close, very close-knit family, and during the war, they would always stay together. Uh, as time went on, problems were encountered. The Philippine army, the whole defense, ex the whole defense system, was an expensive experiment, and it had to be useful in peacetime. So MacArthur made it a point to add a lot of uh, training facilities, a lot of training uh, periods, a lot of these also to be useful in peacetime. Things like planting trees, uh, raising, uh, raising cattle, raising uh, roosters and chickens, and even basic sanitation and literacy would be provided by the Philippine Army training. There would be trouble relating to the weapons and equipment that MacArthur was uh, buying and that the uh, local manufacturers were providing. Some of these were because the budgetary restraints could not allow for more expensive weapons or equipment. And then even the training itself, uh, although it was monitored by American officers, uh, some of it was no longer purely military. So these training programs became diluted with the other, uh, pro uh, other programs, literacy, sanitation, and other programs, and that there was not enough stewardship. So the public face of the army seemed imposing, even with their guinea helmets and short, short sleeve shirts and short pants. But uh, as we can see, uh, this is a, one of the training photos inside Camp Aguinaldo, Camp Murphy. It is an ambulance and you have the first aid men training on what to do with the uh, casualties in the battlefield. But these vehicles were actually not enough. The others would have to be commandeered. And other aspects or other services of the army would train. The engineers, for example, would train on building bridges. But the bridges were rather rickety ones, as we will see. Uh, the engineers would uh, train with whatever facilities they had. And here we can see uh, some of the Philippine army engineers trying to put up a pontoon bridge. But you'll notice that this is only a pontoon bridge for persons and not for vehicles. On the bottom right, we see another of the basic uh, the part of the basic ideas of the, of the defense plan was to stop the enemy at the beach. And here we see relatively small caliber guns, 75 millimeter guns, 
uh, trainees are here. They would train here every year, try to experiment with how to protect the beaches. This is in Lingayen Gulf, where the Japanese would eventually land in 1941. But you'd see that with these guns, the range was not very far. And these were very small in comparison with warship guns. The larger guns that the Philippine army would train with, such as this, which is more than twice the size of the guns we saw earlier, these were not Philippine army owned. These were rented or these were borrowed from the U.S. Army. In fact, we even had to uh, take a, uh, we had to take a, an insurance clause so that in case they were damaged, we would pay for the damages. But these were part of the defense system that the Philippine army was supposed to bring in. And although they were borrowed guns, uh, our soldiers trained with them. Others trained in the coast artillery, uh, not on Corregidor, that was basically an American, uh, really a secret American base at the time. So the Philippine army men trained on Fort Wind in Grand Island in Subic Bay. The overall plan was, aside from covering Manila Bay and Subic Bay, to set up a system of batteries, coast artillery batteries, that would block any entrance into the Visayas seas so that Luzon could connect with the Visayas in Mindanao in case of an enemy blockade. But that was nice on paper. The project was never really completed. In some cases, this is what the Philippine army really looked like. So while the publicity photographs showed it with vehicles, in some cases, this was what a real Philippine army ambulance looked like. Uh, this was a carabao supposed to be bringing a person wounded in combat to the rear lines. So the reality was usually different from the what was on paper. There was also a plan to put up an offshore patrol. The offshore patrol was supposed to guard the Philippine coasts. And this involved, as MacArthur planned, 50 patrol torpedo boats like this, which would be stationed around the Philippines and which would then be able to protect, protect the Philippine shores. When World War II started, we had only three of these, and they came from Britain because the uh, Americans didn't have the same type of boat at that time. Aside from the offshore patrol boats, there was the U.S. Navy in the Philippines, the Asiatic Fleet, which, although equipped with old ships, was of more strategic importance than the offshore patrol torpedo boats. These are some of the Asiatic fleets, but MacArthur did not want to be connected with the U.S. Navy. We can say the Army-Navy rivalry was there, and so the uh, U.S. Navy was conveniently left out of MacArthur's planning. Part of the Philippine Army was what was called the Philippine Army Air Corps. It was not yet the Philippine Air Force. This too went off on a slow start, and pilots had to be trained for flying first. Mostly the planes, therefore, were training planes equipped with bomb racks and two machine guns. Some of the airfields in the Philippines, particularly this one in the south in Mindanao, had no support equipment whatsoever, and this particular plane had to be refueled by hand from five-gallon cans. But the pilots were good. But war clouds began to appear by the 1937 onwards. In July 1937, Japan went to war against China, and two years later, in September 1939, Germany invaded Poland. In June of 1940, Germany conquered France. These were very serious uh, international events. The war in China affected the Philippines in the sense that refugees came flowing to the Philippines and showed that the Japanese army was a major army to reckon with in Asia. To make things even worse, there were quite a number of Japanese in the Philippines. It was a big resident community in Davao, and there were Japanese all over the place in mines, fishing boats, and with photography studios. When Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, Polish resistance was crushed very quickly. And when Germany conquered France, that also meant a very severe blow to France's, uh, France's pride. That meant that these countries, even though they were very, very bravely defended by men, could not stand up to the Japanese or the German onslaught. So there was what was called the 
Blitzkrieg. And Japan went into China, as shown here, and into Poland using tanks and aircraft, what was called the Blitzkrieg or the Lightning War. And the defeats here showed that if armies like the French army, which had a very sizable, very important background, or dating all the way back to Napoleon, if those could be defeated, what would happen in the Philippines? So Quezon begins to consult with his general staff. Was MacArthur's plan viable? Was it really workable? Uh, one problem was that MacArthur was becoming hard to meet at this particular point, and MacArthur uh, was difficult for Quezon to reach. So Quezon would turn to his Philippine Army General Staff and also turn to uh, Major Eisenhower. So this was the Philippine Army General Staff circa 1937, and Chief of Staff was General Paulino Santos. He's there in the center. Uh, uh, General Valdez, Basilio Valdez, who had succeeded him, is to General Santos' left. To General Valdez' left is General Lim, who was the first Filipino to graduate from West Point and probably the best uh, trained Philippine officer in the Philippines. Quezon would turn to him for advice gradually as MacArthur proved difficult to reach. There were doubts that the general staff would air relating to MacArthur's plan. There was no plan to defend Mindanao. The training program was not going according to plan. The second-rate arms that were being acquired were of dubious value. And because of all of these questions, Quezon changed his mind midstream. With the fall of France particular, particularly, Quezon would distance himself from MacArthur, cut the budget to the army, and came closer to Eisenhower and Lim. Eisenhower was in fact closer to Quezon, and Quezon would even have an office for Eisenhower in Malacanang Palace. Quezon would focus more on civil defense, saying that the responsibility of national defense was still in American hands. And the U.S. Army in the Philippines was something called the Philippine Department. Uh, in the United States, because of what was going on, MacArthur was, uh, con it was considered to bring MacArthur back to the United States. And instead, MacArthur retired from the U.S. Army and gradually became marginalized. So the Philippine Department was uh, now in full swing. The Philippine Department, under the command of Major General Grunert, based in Fort Santiago, uh, was trying to build itself up for full-scale war. And Grunert was traveling all over the Philippines to see how he could improve the defense system, built up the Philippine scouts to maximum strength, and tried to increase the strength of the Philippine division in the Philippines. MacArthur was not on particular good terms with Gruner, as this picture shows. So the, the body language speaks volumes in this particular case. But as the world moved towards global war, Eisenhower decided to return to the United States, even though Quezon tried all means possible to make him stay. But Quezon realized that a global war was coming and that he had to be in the United States in active service with the U.S. Army to command part of that army. So here is Quezon looking on as Mrs. Eisenhower pins on a reward, a medal from the Philippine government. After Eisenhower returned to the United States, international conditions began to worsen and they would reach a turning point in July of 1941. Just as MacArthur's future seemed to be at a dead end, the Japanese troops moved into Southern Indochina or Vietnam today. This was the breaking point for the United States. President Roosevelt immediately embargoed oil, freeze, uh, froze all Japanese assets in the United States and its territories, including the Philippines, and created the USAFE, U.S. Army Forces in the Far East, which combined the Philippine Army and the U.S. Army, although they would share, they would not have the same uh, they would not have the same pay scales. MacArthur was called from retirement and placed in command. And the Philippine Army, which would now be mobilized, would be inducted into U.S. service. MacArthur, now in command of the defense system in the Philippines, was for revising the American war plans in the Philippines, which were quite defeatist, and called for reinforcements. Not wanting to have any competition in the Philippines, he sent General Gruner back to the United States. Following this, 
the Philippine Army was mobilized and the first Army unit to be inducted into the USAFE was the Philippine Army Air Corps. This is MacArthur instructing the Philippine Army Air Corps, its pilots, its mechanics, and its staff to write their history in blood on the breasts of their enemy. Other elements of the Philippine Army also took their oath of allegiance to the United States as they were organized gradually. In the bottom right, this is, these are parts of the Philippine Constabulary, which are being inducted into the USAFE staff. So after this, you'd have the other units being taken up. You'd have other uh, units being called to active service. And all over the Philippines, young men who had undergone the original training plan were reporting for active service. The photo above is uh, taken in Baguio, and this shows a number of the Igrots in Baguio lining up in the uh, enlistment uh, camp. And in the bottom right, we have a publicity photograph showing three major uh, cultural groups of the Philippines volunteering and enlisting for service. Uh, one from the Mountain Province, and one from Mindanao, and one from the Central Luzon area. You can see a Guinea helmet there, the coconut husk helmet there. So the Philippine Army Reserves were mobilized, and that mobilization was nationwide. Training was started even as temporary camps were built. These uh, men would be seen all over the Philippines, but the next picture would show a particular group that would distinguish itself in, in, in Bataan. These are members of what would become known as the 41st Division in their cantonment area or training area in Tagaytay. The bottom right photograph shows the camp team still being built. The upper left photograph shows them training, bayonet training, as the uh, war nears. Uh, so temporary camps were built, and then by this time, the offshore patrol in the Philippines now had three boats, all from uh, two from England, one manufactured in the Philippines with Philippine uh, lumber, but British parts. Eight more were under construction. The eight would never be completed because the Japanese would start the war before they were completed. The Air Corps was strengthened by several fighter planes turned over by the U.S. to the Philippine Army Air Corps. But these were old planes that were no longer needed by the U.S. Army Air Corps. It became apparent that the five reserve and two regular divisions in Luzon were not enough to defend Luzon. And therefore, troops had to be sent from other places to support the defense of Luzon. These are soldiers or these are recruits, trainees from Negros, who are going to board the uh, ship Neg uh, Corregidor to go to Luzon to beef up the defenses of Luzon. Others would come in from Samar Leyte. For some of these men, it would definitely be the first time they would leave their homes. It would be the first time they would leave their islands. Many would not return because they would die either in Bataan or in the concentration camp that followed. Reinforcements from the United States began to arrive. MacArthur pushed and pushed to get modern equipment, to get more men, and to get even tanks and the most modern aircraft. So by late 1941, the airmen began to arrive, the most modern tanks began to arrive, and of course General Grunert by this time had been sent home. The new planes were coming in, and the most modern United States Army bomber was what was called the Flying Fortress. They arrived in September and on the, all the way down to November. More were coming. This newly arrived B-17 Flying Fortress is parked in Iba Field in Zambales, where the only operational radar set in the country was located. The plane is very new. It's not even painted yet, so it's in natural silver. Based on the training schedules and the planned shipments of reinforcements, MacArthur felt that he would be ready by March of 1942. The Japanese knew this, however, and thus struck without warning. Just a few hours after attacking Pearl Harbor, Japanese planes bombed Davao and Baguio. At noon, they bombed Clark Field. This is what Clark Field looked before the war. It's what the Japanese bombers would have seen at that particular time also, with most of the planes caught on the ground. So on day one, MacArthur lost most of his air force. Also hit, aside from Clark, was Iba Airfield, the photo that we saw earlier, destroying the only radar set in operation in the Philippines. 
in a few hours, Nichols Field, which is now Villamor Field, very close to Manila in Paranaque, was struck. And that would be seen by the whole of Manila. Quezon and MacArthur would come together. And now this time, they would be friends. So in fact, the first person to greet MacArthur on his appointment as commanding general of USAFE was Quezon himself. So here they are in Quezon's uh, summer home in Marikina, the closest of friends, it would seem, the period of the Cold War silence and forgotten. But the Japanese bombings were unopposed because most of the American fighter planes and the bombers had been destroyed on the ground. And Manila itself was hit. Santo Domingo Church in Intramuros was hit and destroyed. It was considered the most beautiful in the walled city, but was an early casualty to the war. The other photograph shows houses in Taft Avenue burning. When the main Japanese landings took place at Lingayen Gulf, the Philippine Army, Philippine Army soldiers were like this. They were dressed in maong, uh, denim, and this is a mortar crew preparing to defend the beaches. Uh, they were, they had high morale. They thought they were able to, they, were, they thought they were able to repulse a Japanese attack. But unfortunately, when the Japanese did attack in full strength, the Japanese meant business. So the main Japanese landings did take place at Lingayen Gulf. And the Japanese forces landed were either where the troops were spread thin, actually not in Pangasinan, but in, more in La Union, and the troops were spread thin or were moving to challenge the Japanese landing at Vigan. The Japanese soldiers, most of whom were veterans of the China campaign, and with naval and air support, quickly forced the Yusafe back down, well, despite some cases of heroism. Among the cases of heroism was that of Captain Jesus Villamor, who led his fighter squadron against all odds against modern Japanese fighters. MacArthur had time to award Villamor personally at Fort Santiago, which was Yusafe headquarters. But MacArthur himself and Quezon and a select war cabinet had to go to Corregidor after declaring Manila an open city to prevent damage from further Japanese bombs, bombings. And Manila being, uh, Manila being exposed to Japanese bombs meant that Quezon and MacArthur might become casualties of the war. So they moved to Corregidor and MacArthur declared War Plan Orange in effect. That meant withdrawing to Bataan and Corregidor, abandoning the beaches, having a fighting withdrawal, blowing up bridges where they could, uh, where they could to stop the uh, Japanese invasion forces from moving further. And just before MacArthur and Quezon left for Corregidor, they met together in Quezon's Marikina summer house when a cabinet meeting was in session. There, the cabinet members of Quezon, including Josepi Laurel, Jorge Vargas, and others, asked MacArthur what they could do if the Japanese took over Manila. And MacArthur is reported to have told them, if not directly, then by telephone. He was, or he, he was reported to have told them to co cooperate with the Japanese, but do not take an oath of allegiance to the Japanese. Uh, the MacArthur would deny this after the war, but most of those who attended the cabinet meeting remembered it very clearly. In Corregidor, MacArthur set up his headquarters in Lateral 3 in Malinta Tunnel. Quezon's office and quarters were next door, uh, and here he monitored the fighting in Bataan with his chief of staff next to him, General Sutherland. He received assurance from Washington that help was on the way. And during the siege of Bataan, MacArthur made only one trip to Bataan, personally, on January 10, 1942. Some of the men Bataan met didn't relish that visit because they remembered long after they had to clean up and dress for it. Others, however, argued that MacArthur could have visited more often to prop up morale. Since he was seen only once in Bataan, some of the Americans derisively called him Dugout Dog, using his nickname, Dog, and the dugout referring to uh, trying to hide inside a foxhole. There were victories in Bataan, such as the Battles of the Points and the Battles of the Pockets, which were resounding defeats for the Japanese. 
the Japanese were in fact so defeated by these particular battles that the Yusafe Yusafe's men had become battle-hardened veterans and were able to stand their own ground by this time. General Homa was unsuccessful in meeting his deadline and therefore had to withdraw his troops to the, from the front and await reinforcements. A lull occurred. And during that lull, there were the losses and most of the available photos that we have of Filipinos in Bataan show them wounded or in the hospitals, not in the front lines. Filipino soldiers suffered not only from combat wounds, but also from shortages of food and medicine. They became sick and they became, became, very, became very hungry. MacArthur, despite his demeaning nickname in Bataan, exhibited courage in Corregidor, exposing himself, sometimes needlessly, to enemy air attacks. Here he exits Malinta Tunnel with his chief of staff, General Sutherland. Sometimes an air raid would be in progress, but he would not seek shelter. He would never be pictured wearing a helmet during the war. MacArthur's family was a soldier's family. So they came with him. They accompanied him to Corregidor to share in the difficulties of wartime life on the rock. So Jean MacArthur, Mrs. MacArthur, was with him. And here they are together in Corregidor. And so was their son, Arthur. And Arthur thought that it was quite an adventure in Corregidor. He dressed in khakis and was cons and considered himself a surgeon. He didn't want anything higher than that. He was happy enough with the rank of surgeon. But as we know, MacArthur and Quezon would leave Corregidor after the writing was on the wall. But Ann fell on April 9 and Corregidor almost a month later. What went wrong? Was it the training plan? Was it reliance on help that never came? Was it due to the disasters at the beginning of the war? Were there mistaken assumptions and decisions? Was there failure to move enough food and medicine? Or were there other options? Uh, General Lim proposed a counterattack when the lull took place. Quezon proposed declaring the Philippines independent and neutralizing the whole Philippines at the height of the siege. Would it have helped if MacArthur had visited Bataan again? We'll never know the answer to this question because we can't change what happened. But we can learn from all this. Thank you for listening, and I turn you over to our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Jose, for that very informative and very insightful presentation. Questions for Dr. Jose may be sent via the Q and A box for those in Zoom, and via the comment. Uh, and you can, for those on FB Live, you can type it in the comment boxes. So we have heard Dr. Jose's lecture from MacArthur's appointment as the military advisor of the Commonwealth up to the outbreak of the war. So our next speaker, James Zobel, is director and archivist of the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk, Virginia. We are very fortunate to have Jim tonight, and he will discuss with us where Dr. Jose left off, from the time MacArthur was ordered out of Australia to the island hopping campaign and the liberation of the Philippines until the end of the war. Your mic, James. Uh, thanks, Des, and good to see you. Good to see everybody. Uh, Dr. Jose, always learn something whenever you're talking. Uh, very good deal. Um, and so Des asked me to go through the basically the campaigns of MacArthur from Australia all the way to the Philippines, about three and a half years. So we're going to try and do that in about 30 minutes. So let's get going. Now, MacArthur leaves the Philippines. Oh, there we go. And next one. MacArthur uh, is ordered out of the Philippines on 22 uh, February 1942, and he'll leave by the PT boats on March 11th. They go down to Mindanao, the bombers come in, fly them off to Australia. Now, what MacArthur did was he left uh, Brigadier General Lewis B. That's the guy down there at the bottom left corner with Sutherland. He leaves him as chief of staff, and that way MacArthur was still going to have control of what was going on in the Philippines. He'll use uh, Beebe as a guy who like funnels orders to the different commands, and MacArthur sets it up that way so if one group surrenders, the other group is not going to. The thing is, when MacArthur leaves, he doesn't tell Washington that. So Washington immediately deals with Wainwright as he's the uh, total commander there, and uh, the Japanese know that, and so when uh, uh, things fall down and everybody's going to go. MacArthur wanted like Sharp on Mindanao to go guerrilla, but now that Wainwright surrendered, they, the Japanese know that, so they, he's able to force 
of them to surrender in the islands. And MacArthur will rail against both Wainwright and King for surrendering Bataan as well as Corregidor. Now, MacArthur arrives in Australia and finds basically there's nothing there. There's about uh, a few uh, 20,000 service troops. You got maybe a few hundred planes that can work. The Australian units are in North Africa fighting with the British, and you've got really no American troops there. And now he's got the support of Chief of Staff George C. Marshall. Are we back? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, uh, publicly MacArthur's going to put on this brave face, and the Australians all go crazy when he gets down there. Uh, but more than anything, MacArthur wants to get back into the fight, and, uh, it, you know, his whole focus is the Philippines, I shall return. And it's, it's basically, yeah, we're gonna fighting against to beat Japan, but we're going to the Philippines first. Now, about a month after they get to Australia, the Joint Chiefs of Staff carve out the Southwest Pacific area. Uh, which MacArthur will control. Australia, New Guinea, Indonesia, the Philippines, the rest of it will be under Nimitz. Now, Ernest King, the guy on the left, he's the chief of naval operations. He thinks MacArthur's crazy. Uh, Admiral Hart, who had been in the Philippines with MacArthur, has gone back to Washington, told him all these goofy stories about MacArthur because he's got these traits, and King just is not going to trust him at all. Uh, but Marshall will. He'll, he'll back MacArthur. But as Chief of Swapa, MacArthur is basically like the supreme coordinator. Uh, he's not going to be able to control any forces, but he'll control the people that uh, work under him, all the different allies. And there's never going to be a unified command in the Pacific because there's no way they're going to give MacArthur control of aircraft carriers. Now, it's a Europe first policy. The Pacific is supposed to be on a strategic defensive, of, but the Japanese don't get the memo, and they're still coming. I mean, they've landed in Rabaul in January, uh, March, they're down in Salamaua and Leg. Now, MacArthur has his staff still, the one that he brought out of the Philippines. These guys are around him, and they pretty much insulate him from everything. And MacArthur's got an air commander named Brett that he doesn't trust. It's the guy who sent up a bunch of dilapidated B-17s to pick him up from Mindanao. And then he's got uh, his uh, land force commander, an Australian that he was forced to pick, a guy named Thomas Blamey. They'll have a very enigmatic relationship uh, throughout the war, uh, Australians versus Americans, and working with Americans, always different. And then he's got two naval commanders that he'll work through. Uh, 44 with Carpenter and Leary, but MacArthur doesn't really trust these guys. Now, what he does have is he's got the backing of John Curtin, the Prime Minister of Australia, and they've got this reverse lend-lease program going on where Australia provides all the food and all the, you know, uh, basic materials, whereas the uh, United States will bring in all the equipment. And MacArthur knows as long as he's got Curtin at his back, he's got a strong position there. Now, this is the group that MacArthur really trusts. The guy at the head of the table is Spencer Aiken. And this is, this is MacArthur's code breakers. Uh, Aiken's going to run this group. A lot of the Americans out of them are brought from uh, Corregidor by PT boat as well as submarine. Now, whereas MacArthur does not integrate most of his command uh, with Australians, Dutch, all these different allies, he does put all the brainiacs, all the eggheads from all the different uh, nationalities into this group because he needs them. These are going to be the most important guys that will get MacArthur back to the Philippines. They're the, the critical element, really. Now, in May, June of 1942, Navy code breaking leads to the destruction of five carriers at Coral Sea Midway. It's supposed to be a strategic defensive in the Pacific, but because of this, Ernest King is like, let's go on the move right now. As well, MacArthur is, let's go it against Rabaul right now. Now, that's the main Japanese base. It's got Simpson Harbor, about five airfields, about 100,000 troops. MacArthur's like, give me everything, and we'll go there immediately. And uh, King's like, hold on, cowboy. You know, this is going to take quite a while. So the JCS comes up with this program of task one, two, and three. And one is dropping the Marines in Guadalcanal, and two is putting MacArthur on the north coast of Papua New Guinea. Now, MacArthur's got Australian troops 
due to be coming back from North Africa, the seventh division. And he's got the 32nd and the 41st infantry, two national guard divisions of the show. They're untrained. They're not ready for what's coming up. And, uh, Basically, as a lot of people have said, the best troops in World War II uh, from America are the regular army, then the draftees and the National Guard. Now, I don't agree with that because I think it gets everybody going pretty well, but that's what you're looking at. Now, before they can move up to the North Coast, though, the Japanese are going to land. Before July, MacArthur was funneling a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, airplanes into that tip of New Guinea at Milne Bay and then at Port Moresby that right there on the South Coast. And uh, they were hoping to pull off this Operation Providence, which would launch them to the North Coast, but the Japanese land there first. Uh, Tomatari Hori, South Seas Detachment. Uh, these are some of the best troops the Japanese are going to have. They push over the Owen Stanley Mountains, 7,000 feet and they get about 17 miles from Port Moresby and they're faced by Papuan Constabulary and Australian militia who are fighting them tooth and nail uh, over this trail and the thing is is uh, they're going to get right close to Moresby which has the five airfields if they can take that they can isolate uh, Australia but uh, basically what happens is um uh, the Japanese uh, high command says they're going to start throwing everything to Guadalcanal. And uh, and so Tomatari Hori has to pull back over those mountains. Uh, they hold up on the north coast at Bunagona, Sananda, but it's going to be World War One fighting all over. They've got no tanks, no flamethrowers, no heavy equipment, and it's just going to be uh, pretty much... Uh, you know, single shot rifle with machine guns against uh, coconut bunkers. And that's what you're going to have for a while. Now, in August of 42, uh, General George Kenny shows up. Now, Kenny arrives, he signals the change in MacArthur from this man behind the desk, this guy who's been uh, spending the past bunch of years just listening to advisors come to this guy who actually gets into the mix with everything. Kenny gets him back actively. And when Kenny shows up, he fires five generals. He fires five or 40 majors and colonels. And that's what he, sh it shows what he thought uh, MacArthur was working with as far as the Air Corps goes. And he really gets bombers back over a bow. He gets the supply system really taken care of. But most importantly, and, and I always say this, I think he resurrects that MacArthur of 1918, the World War I MacArthur, because he'll go to MacArthur and say, hey, let, let's fly up and see these guys. Or why don't we go over here? MacArthur's like, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. That's what I mean. He gets MacArthur all back into it. And so the main thing of these two is they create the strategy of advancing the bomber line and advancing the bomber line forward so they can move against the Japanese. Now, at Bunagona, uh, Sanananda, uh, shipping deficiencies lead to all these innovations in air power. They're flying mass groups up to, to Papua New Guinea. They're using them to supply people. They're using them as allied artillery, but still the campaign is a, a complete mess. The Japanese were stopped in September, as I said, going to Moresby. They pulled back to the North Coast. Uh, Tomatar Hori got drowned uh, trying to cross the Kamusi River. Uh, but once they get there, they've got that high ground. It takes 30 minutes to go between their lines. The Allies are in the swamps around them. It takes two days to get to them. And malaria just starts crushing the Australians as well as the uh, Americans there. Now, MacArthur's going to berate the Australians. The Australians are going to berate the MacArthur. You know, we'd rather have Australians because we've seen how Americans fight and they can't fight. And MacArthur's going to have to swallow hard and all that. But it's like MacArthur said to uh, General Tubby Allen of the Australians, if we don't get this thing going, we're all going to be out of the war. You know, they're going to they're going to shut us down immediately. Now, Blamey and MacArthur, this is, again, that enigmatic relationship. They're going to be firing everybody. Uh, to get this thing going, because they want to get this. Uh, they've lost six months already. Now, when the 32nd Division gets into it up around Buna, they perform pretty miserably. Like I said, they were untrained. These are National Guard troops. Uh, Edward Harding is, uh, uh, they call him the Gentle Knight. And uh, MacArthur is really upset about what's going on, mainly because he's hearing all the criticism coming from the Australians. So he sends Eichelberger up there, his first Corps commander. And uh, everybody knows the story, take Buna or don't come back alive. And basically the next day MacArthur went up to him and said, you know, I didn't really mean that. That's what my World War One commander told me right before Cody Chatillon. And I hated him my whole life. You don't hate me, do you, Bob? So Bob flies up to the North Coast 
and he meets with Harding. He gets rid of him immediately, gets rid of all these staff officers, says that they've just been locked down in this complacency. And when Harding goes back to see MacArthur, MacArthur's basically like, I, I really have no idea why he fired you. Thing is, Eichelberger doesn't perform uh, even as well as uh, Harding did. And MacArthur was almost at the point where he was about to get rid of Eichelberger, too. But then they finally got these tanks in there uh, to get up right on those coconut bunkers. The Australian 18th Brigade was brought up to that Buna uh, area, and they're able to take uh, Buna Gunasananda by by January, and it's and, and it's finally they just needed the the firepower to overwhelm. Now the Buna victory was extremely costly, even though MacArthur said it was had limited casualties because they weren't worried about the time schedule, which is exactly the opposite of the reality. They'll have more casualties than they do on Guadalcanal, mostly from malaria. Uh, but now they know how to fight this jungle war. Uh, the lessons are crucial for uh, the future of the war. Australians under Blamey and uh, the Americans under Eichelberger, they were able to pull this thing out. Eichelberger will be the big hero in the press, and he'll get sidelined by MacArthur for it. Um, now, actually, this was a very good thing because then Eichelberger becomes the guy who trains all those troops that come to the Southwest Pacific area. He's got all that knowledge of uh, the conditions and how they're going to have to fight this war, and he imparts that to everyone. So though he's sidelined, it works out for the best in the war effort. Now, MacArthur has got his forward airfields now with Buna. And he can start this strategy where he's using uh, land-based air power to cover limited amphibious moves. And he won't need aircraft carriers for this. Now, in January of 1943, uh, he gets two other members of his team. He's got Kenny, uh, Walter Kruger, Dan Barbie. Now, Walter Kruger is the same age, or a year younger MacArthur has the same birthday. He would have been cashiered uh, from the Army, but MacArthur was like, nope, send him out to me. And Kruger does the same thing Kinney does. He gets in there and he just uh, totally revamps the supply system, gets rid of all the, the people who are just dead weight, basically. And MacArthur's going to create this Alamo force with Kruger's Sixth Army. You see, MacArthur can't control any national force, but if he creates a task force, he can have control of that. And that's what he's going to use Kruger's men, because MacArthur's planning on separating from the Australians as soon as they get to a certain point on New Guinea. Now, MacArthur trusts Kruger implicitly. He's going to give him operational control of most all the operations. Kruger will set them all up. Now, the other guy, Dan Barbie, he's the greatest gift that the Navy will ever give to MacArthur. Uh, and a lot of people said that the only reason Admiral King gave Dan Barbie to MacArthur is because he hated Dan Barbie as much as he hated MacArthur. But... Barbie gets out there, finds out he's got no ships whatsoever. He doesn't have a staff, basically, but he gets all the amphibious schools going. There was the two amphibious army brigades that have been trading up at Cape Cod in, like, 42, and King doesn't want them in the Navy, so Barbie's like, yeah, send them to me. We'll use them. And so now he's got this amphibious machine going. Now, Barbie doesn't like MacArthur personally. He says there's no warmth in the guy. He's all business. He's all military. But he said he was the best boss he could have ever had because MacArthur gives you a job and he's like, you do it and I'm not going to bug you. If you mess up, you'll see what the consequences are. But that's why all these guys like working for him. Now, in March of 43, uh, the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, and this really changes things in New Guinea. What it is, is signal intelligence uh, showed that the Japanese were going to try and reinforce New Guinea. Now, this is after the Buna Gona Sananda victory. And the next obvious place for MacArthur to go is up right on the Huon Peninsula, Huon Gulf, at a place called Salamala and Ley. So what they want to do is reinforce that New Guinea area. And they're going to put Lieutenant General Adazo Adachi and his 18th Army in there with about 8,000 troops. But signal intelligence, uh, once again... Um, Aiken's code breakers, they finally make their first break in the water transport code. They pick up that this convoy's coming. They use a uh, duped aircraft to say, you know, we saw the convoy coming, and then they hammer it. And Australian, New Zealand, American pilots uh, send this thing to the bottom. Uh, the, the Japanese will lose thousands of troops. It changes that balance right, of, right at that point in New Guinea. 
And this is uh, the thing. The thing is, all the the aircraft guys were saying we should we sunk twice as many ships as they said we did. And MacArthur backs him up, and then they get in a big fight with the War Department about it. But it was like basically just shut up. You, you had a great victory. Just quit haggling over it. And this comes right at a time that the Pacific Conference is deciding on this cartwheel uh, plan. Now, what this is, is they want to have a dual drive that goes up the Solomon Islands and the coast of New Guinea, heading for that main Japanese base at Rabaul. This was that task three of the task one, two, three that they made. Now, this is MacArthur's uh, area, so they're going to give MacArthur control of this, and he's going to have to work with Admiral Halsey. Now, Halsey shows up April of uh, 43. Everybody thinks there's going to be this big explosion between the Navy and the Army, but these guys love each other. I mean, MacArthur remembers Halsey from playing football, so he's his kind of guy. Uh, Halsey has this nickname called Bull, and nobody ever calls him Bull, but MacArthur does, and Halsey kind of likes it, and Halsey said uh, MacArthur would never use a curse word because it would ruin the eloquence of his diction. You know, MacArthur's just got this way of speaking. Now, MacArthur's in control. He'll argue with Halsey a lot, but he always lets Halsey do what Halsey wants to do, and that's what, you know, Halsey will say. And they put together this operation that they will move up towards Rabaul. Now, uh, cartwheel the, is 13 scheduled landings. They're going to move up that coast of New Guinea on the left, up to that Huon Peninsula that juts out, lay Salamau right below that. And then, uh, as you know, Halsey comes up the Solomons, Bougainville, New Georgia, all those campaigns. And they're heading for that uh, Rabaul base, which is right at the right tip of New Britain there. 13 landings. They're going to, MacArthur's going to formulate the strategy for this. He'll pick the commanders. He'll issue the directives. But once all that goes out, he leaves it to the commanders. Now, this is MacArthur's team here. There's Barbie, MacArthur, there's Kinney, and there's Kruger. Uh, Kruger, like I said, has operational control. He works out all the details with the Navy and the Army Air Corps. And what they do is if they ever have sticking points, that's when they go to MacArthur and MacArthur resolves it. And people will say that MacArthur's staff, not these guys, but his staff uh, really didn't have any idea what was going on. But MacArthur had it all in his head. So MacArthur's kind of like the overseer of all these people because the Navy's always worried about Army air cover. The Army's always worried about naval support. And they work out most problems, but they all see MacArthur as this arbiter, and they all see him as the driving force. Like I said, Kruger's going to operate as Alamo Force. They will move up those outlying uh, islands, Kiriwana, Woodlark, New Britain, um, moving that way, whereas the Australians will move up the coast of Australia. Now, same with uh, MacArthur's control of uh, these guys. With the Australians, it's it's... Pretty much the same. They let them work out the details, even though Fifth Air Force is only sending maybe junior officers to the Australians. Next slide, please. Now, the Australians are going to put together this campaign to go at Ley and Salamawa. This is Thomas Blamey on the left. Uh, that's George Basie, the 7th Division Commander, and Wooten, the 9th Division Commander. And that's, that's uh, Ley Airport right there. It's right on the coast of, of the Huon Gulf. Now, the Australians put together this brilliant plan. They dropped the American 503rd at this place called Nadzab. They're going to build a huge base there. They meet up with the 7th Australian Division that's come overland. And then Blamey holds them off to keep Salamawa duped. And then he lands Wooten's 9th Division up at Ley, and they have this convergence, which then pretty much wipes out the Japanese resistance. They have to push off to the west. Uh, there was a lot of problems with the air cover. Uh, that's problems that will be worked out later. Um, and But the thing is, now you get into this problem of speed, because MacArthur's so ecstatic at how this thing worked out. He pushes the Australians to go to the eastern tip of the Huon Peninsula and take Finchhaven like the next month to advance the timetable. Australians go in, but the Japanese have moved down the 20th Division, and they set up in the Saddleberg Mountains, and at Finchhaven, you get into this big, hairy fight. Blamey goes to Barbie, says, you know, the amphib commander says, bring in more Australians, and Barbie's like, I'm not going to do that. So Blamey has to go to MacArthur. MacArthur gets Barbie. That's what I mean. When they have these problems, they all go to MacArthur, and he works it out. That's the problem. Speed. They're trying to move as fast as he possibly can to keep the Japanese off balance. Now, in December of 1943, right in the middle of Operation Dexterity, the U.S. Marines were, the 1st Division was about to go into New Britain at Cape Gloucester. 
and George C. Marshall shows up. Now, George C. Marshall is the chief of staff. This is his only visit to the Southwest Pacific area. Now, it, it's understandable. In Europe, you had the entire war plans division of the War Department working out European strategy. And MacArthur's theater, he takes care of it. You know, his guys take care of it. Uh, but when Marshall comes out there, MacArthur said that Marshall told him, uh, you're probably not going back to the Philippines. They just had the Casablanca and the Tehran conferences. And he says, you know, you, this might be going to a totally a Central Pacific drive. And MacArthur also said that, that Marshall told him that King's totally against you. The Navy is always working against you. And so you got to wonder uh, with this, does MacArthur feel that he's got to do something extra significant, extra spectacular, because that's exactly what's going to happen coming up in a couple of months. Now, at Sidor in January of 1944, this is one of the most, uh, has most impact on the campaigns. Now, 32nd uh, Division's regimental combat team under Julian Cunningham, that's the guy on the left, he goes in at Sidor. That's where that first arrow starts on New Guinea right there. The plan was for them to push deep into New Guinea and cut off all the Japanese retreating from the Australians. But they didn't push deep enough. And so most of the Japanese got past them. But what it did was it forced that 20th Division to move out of a town called Sayo. Australian minesweepers go in. They think they find a mine. It's a trunk. It's got every Japanese code book in it. Overnight, there's signal intelligence aching again up there. Uh, the Central Bureau, the code breakers, go from breaking maybe a few messages a week to hundreds a day. And now MacArthur has a complete picture of where everybody is in the Southwest Pacific. Now, the end of cartwheel was supposed to converge on Weewak, Hansa Bay. But because of code breaking, they know that there are 40,000 troops under Adachi there. But they all, code breaking also shows that just west of that, about 580 miles past Finchhaven, where they're going to base all this stuff out of now, there's only about 11,000. And so MacArthur with this code break says, I, I can move right in there, you know, uh, and isolate Adachi, leave him to die on the vine. But to do that, he's got to take these Admiralty Islands, which are on his flank. Now, this is the key campaign of all that comes up. And it is spectacular because it's almost this overnight of, uh, campaign that gets pulled off. General Kinney, the air chief, comes in and he starts saying, hey, my pilots, they're not seeing any cook fires. They're not seeing any laundry. We're not seeing anything. I think we should go in there right now and seize these islands. And MacArthur says, all right, well, if Thomas Kincaid, the new naval commander, that's where he is with MacArthur right there, says it's okay, well, then I'll go for it. MacArthur doesn't tell either of them that code breaking has said that there are 4,000 Japanese on the Admiralties and they are waiting. MacArthur is going to trust his instincts and his experience more than anything. That's what always gets him in trouble. And the thing is to him, intelligence is just a tool. But this time, uh, luck is with him. The surprise is with him. MacArthur figured it out just right. If he could get in a way, uh, the thing is, is Barbie and Kruger are against it. But uh, they say, let's go. Overnight, they put uh, about a 1,000 1st Cavalrymen on destroyers. They don't have landing craft. They're going to land them all from destroyers. And Kincaid picks where they're going to go in. They were going to go in at Seedler Harbor. But he says, no, let's go in on this quiet beach, Hyane Harbor. They go in, and the Japanese are totally off balance. And and. MacArthur's complete return to the Philippines is saved by uh, those first cavalryman troopers, a handful of Seabees. That's where they get their name. The fighting Seabees is in this Admiralty's campaign. And then a handful of destroyers that hold off the Japanese for about three days until they can get uh, reinforcements in there. They seize this thing. This is right when they're having the Quebec conference and uh and MacArthur's chief of staff goes in and says, hey, we just took the Admiralty's. And everybody's like, what? And it's like, okay, keep going. And that's basically what it is, because they approve Reno 4, which is going to be the drive that goes across New Guinea all the way to uh, Philippines, basically. Now, Hollandia is a massive success. They bypass Adachi's people. They bring in three task forces from thousands of miles away. The logistics of these campaigns are beyond comprehension. There's no docks in New Guinea. You know, there's basically few airfields except what the Japanese have built. Um, and they put together these massive engineering amphibious landings that 
push right in. Hollandia, the Japanese, there's only about 11,000 service troops are caught off guard, which is great because the, all the troops of that first corps get caught on the beaches. This Eichel Berger's back in the mix again. He's working with Kruger. These guys can't stand each other. MacArthur's setting them up for when he's going to be moving on to the Philippines because this is the last connection that they'll really have with the Australians in New Guinea. When the Guinea, uh, they'll be taking care of operations there while MacArthur moves on. Now, also right here on Hollandia, Kenny and MacArthur went up to Eichelberger and they were like, let's load everybody back up. Let's move 700 miles west to Wakti Island. And MacArthur was like, all right, what do you think, Robert? Eichelberger and uh, Eichelberger was like, no, nah, I don't think we should do that. I think we're set here. We don't have the plan. And he took the cautious move. Now MacArthur, you know, said, okay, that you're the call. Um, but he took note of it, you know, at that point. Now, Hollandia will come the, the lead base for the SWAPA advance headquarters until it moves on to the Philippines in October. And uh, now we're moving on in the Reno Ford. Now the team's set now. The machine has enough gear. At some points in this uh, drive across uh, to the West, Kruger's going to have five operations going at once, and MacArthur's going to still be pushing for speed. They went 300 miles in about the first year and a half of the war. Now they're going to go 1,100 miles in two months. And it's basically because, the, like I said, the machine's working. They've got code breaking telling them where to go. But they're still going to have some really serious problems. Uh, uh, at Biak, uh, the Japanese have dug themselves in the mountains right near the, the airfield. They're not going to defend on the beaches. And they get into a real massive problem. MacArthur's going to have to send in Eichelberger again to get rid of 40, 41st Division Commander um, at that point, Fuller, and uh, it's, it's almost like Papua New Guinea all over again. At Noam Ford, they land the 503rd Airborne, same guys that land in Nazab, same guys that land at Corregidor, and, and they all smash their legs because they drop too low. Back at Atape, uh, Hatazo Adachi's 18th Army goes through the entire jungle to get that far. And even code breaking was telling the Americans that Adachi's army was coming, but still in late July at the Jerunamore River, they almost break 10th Corps lines. And it's a real uh, mean situation right there. But by July of 1944, MacArthur has reached the Vogelkop Peninsula, the westernmost part of New Guinea. Now uh, Nimitz is in the Marianas Islands. They're poised for the next move. And the Navy is all set on going to Formosa. Taiwan and bypassing the Philippines and MacArthur's head figuratively just basically explodes on that one. You know, I've, I've got to see the president. And basically that's what happens. Early July, he gets the message, be in Pearl Harbor on July 26th. They don't tell him what's going on. He's got a pretty good idea. He goes by himself. He shows up. There's the president. There's Admiral Nimitz, there's Admiral Leahy, and they're there to talk MacArthur basically going into uh, Formosa. And like I always said, they do the dumbest thing they can. They get into a closed room with MacArthur. Now, we don't know. Uh, uh, you see different accounts of who spoke first. I think MacArthur did. Uh, but MacArthur gets up and basically first thing says, you know, you can't go to Formosa. If you do, uh, we don't have the shipping. You're going to have to stop the war in Europe. And that's what gets, you know, Nimitz thinking, ah, yeah, that's right, you know. MacArthur always say, also says you can do basically everything strategically from the Philippines, cut off a shipping interdiction that you could do from that coast of, of, of China, um, Formosa. And then after the conference is over, MacArthur looked at Roosevelt and was like, hey, I'd like to have a word with you alone. And uh, Roosevelt was all his hand was like, no, don't talk to him. And MacArthur gets him in the room, says, if we don't go back, a million Filipinos are going to die of starvation. That was true. And I think that's basically what swayed Roosevelt on this was, you know, how are you going to live with that? Because if you don't go back, America's going to lose face in Asia for the next thousand years. If we bypass these people that were our protectorate, that we let get taken over and then they get starved into, you know, complete total death by that. And then they don't make any decision at the Philippine conference. But after a couple of months, they realize it and they give MacArthur to go ahead. Mindanao, November of 44, Leyte, January of 45. And then eventually they'll even get to Luzon when they when they say no to Formosa. 
Now, MacArthur also had another ace up his sleeve. That's his whole guerrilla campaign that he's been running in the Philippines. These guys erupted spontaneously September, October of 42 when they got finally got radio contact. MacArthur starts sending in submarines. There's Chick Parsons down on the bottom. There's Courtney Whitney. He'll run the Philippine regional section. Now, Parsons and all these old Philippine hands, Tom Tarika, his uh, you know a brother-in-law, a, a Phil Grimm, who works for Luzon, Steve Adoring, these guys are going to set up the supply op operation starts pumping in all these weathermen, all these coast watchers, all these air warning people to set it all up for when MacArthur comes back. I mean, if they had landed on Formosa, pretty much everybody would have been a hostile. When you land in the Philippines, you're going to have this group pretty much ready to go. Now, the plan was always to go to Mindanao. But in September of 1944, Halsey was doing his overflights in the Western Pacific operations out there. And he said, hey, I'm not getting any resistance uh, from the Visayas. I think we should move into Leyte right now. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Combined Chiefs, are having their meeting. And uh, they agree with it. MacArthur's right in the middle of that Moratai operation. So he's in radio silence. His Chief of Staff, Sutherland, you know, agrees to it. Yep, let's move up the timetable. They've had a plan for this going. But, it's, it's, again, this, they're able to switch gears immediately because these guys are so ready to go. They'll do it in operation with the uh, the, the Navy fleet. And they, again, they're going to have three amphibious forces coming in, dropping at least 75,000 people that first day, Dulag, Palo, Takloban. And then you, you, we all know what happened. The Navy, Japanese Navy shows up. They get totally smashed by the U.S. Navy. And even though uh, Yamashita doesn't want to defend on Leyte, he wants to man have a maneuverable defense on Luzon. Tokyo High Command says you'll defend at all costs. And so he's got to throw in 54,000 some troops into Leyte. And you basically have 400 that surrender. All that Japanese air power in the Philippines is going to be smashed at Leyte. And like MacArthur says, I'm, he uh, smashed the Japanese army on the anvil of Leyte. And that's what happens because uh, when you get ready to go into Luzon, uh, Yamashita can't have that maneuverable defense. He gets everybody pulled back to the mountains and he's going to have to just sit there and wait it out until it comes. But the thing is, is this shows what happens. Code breaking is not really good anymore. Once you get in close with the Japanese, you've got to engage them. Uh, Leyte becomes this quagmire of rain. You can't get any air cover. You can't get any mechanization. It all becomes hand-to-hand uh, -hand up in those Karigara, Mount Karigara Mountains with that Japanese 1st Division. And the casualty rates just start soaring uh, there on Leyte. Now, they come to realize that they can't go into Formosa, that 14th Air Force there in China gets pushed back when the Japanese moves go, and so they choose Luzon. And Yamasha now has Nishobu, Shimbu, Kembu groups up there in the Bamban, where Ronnie's museum is. And uh, he's pulled back to hold off, but you've got Sanji Iwabuchi in Manila, and he's there with about 16,000 personnel to teach the Americans as well as the Filipinos a lesson. So when they land, Kruger's very worried about all those Japanese on his flank. And he doesn't want to make a quick drive down to Manila until he gets his reinforcements that are going to come in in like late January. MacArthur has told the JCS that he can help support the uh, Iwo Jima landings with bombers. So he needs Clark Field. That's why he's driving him down to take Clark there. As well, Manila is the only port that can really handle uh, the amount of shipping they're going to need to bring in all these uh, relief supplies, weapons, you know, material for 250,000 troops that are going to be there. The second day at Lingayen, you had this big storm. It wiped out all the um, landing, you know, mulberries that they had created at that point. So he's in his, in, in his mind, he's got to get down there. Now, Kruger wonders, does he just want to be there on his birthday? And Kruger also, at finally, you know, at this point, he's, he's like, you know, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And MacArthur's like, okay, okay, I get it. You know, that's what's going to happen. Now, MacArthur will also be playing off his top commanders because now he's got Eichelberger controlling 8th Army and Kruger with 6th Army. He's going to put Eichelberger to the south of Manila and they'll compete to go in for Manila. He's also going to do that with 37th 1st Cavalry Division commander because he wants to get to Manila. When Vermudge and the 1st Cavalry shows up late January, 
MacArthur goes to him. Everybody knows, go to Manila, bounce around the Japanese, uh, free the internees at Santo Tomas, take Malacanon Palace. He really pushes him on this. Uh, but he also he goes to uh, General Beetler, who has the 37th Division. Now, MacArthur and Beetler were both in the 42nd Rainbow Division in World War One. So MacArthur goes to him, you know, I want you to be the first. Hey, you got to be the guy to take Manila. We really need this. So now you've got both of these guys angling to get into Manila as fast as they can. Now, MacArthur really has no idea, no understanding of what awaited. Uh, the guerrillas, uh, Kabang Bang, uh, who had been put in with a radio unit to funnel a lot of information from various different groups, uh, Ramsey's groups uh, with the guys down in Manila, they're not really telling them. Their main group saying is that everybody's moving north. You got Vanderpool down uh, at the south who's been inserted there, and they're saying that, you know, everybody's moving north. And it's not until late January, early February that they start realizing that, hey, they're building all these roadblocks. You've got these pillboxes that they've been constructing down around Fort McKinley. And MacArthur basically thought they would be able to go into the city, open city, like he had had it at the end of uh, 1941. But as we know, it all turned out differently. The Japanese were already burning the city. They had everything ready to destroy pretty much anything coming in. Everybody's declared a guerrilla. They have to create a plan right there. The 37th will clear the north of the city while the 1st Cavalry Division moves around down to the southeast and tries to loop in. you got the 11th Airborne coming from the Gaitai Ridge uh, where they've done a drop there after landing in Nizubu, and they'll come up through Fort McKinley. Now, right before they did that, General Kinney went to Eichelberger. Was he spurred on by MacArthur? We don't know. But Kinney said, let's land the entire 11th Airborne Division right at Nichols Field, right on top of the Japanese. Put all 11,000, drop them, bring it in supplies right there. And Eichelberger was like, no, nah, you know, we can't do that. And uh, Kinney told him right then, okay, well, you're always going to be uh, Kruger's mop-up boy. You know, you're never, you're never going to be the main guy. And if you look at it, Kruger gets that four-star. Eichelberger never will. The city was destroyed. Uh, it took about a month to clear everything. As everybody knows, thousands are murdered, uh, 100,000 civilians. That you know, number comes from Robert Ross Smith. You know, we still try to wonder where exactly it started, um, but we're not sure exactly how many you know, are killed throughout that Holocaust. Now, MacArthur's going to really start playing off these commanders now, uh, Kruger and Eichelberger. Kruger, Ber Kruger had been totally uh, cautious during that uh, move through uh, Luzon, and then he's going to use Eichelberger as this guy to go through the Visayan Islands, clear all the Visayan passages uh, for all the shipping that'll come through, as well as to liberate all those guerrillas, liberate all those islands, all those people that MacArthur had promised uh, that he would do. This is going to be what they call Operation Victor. Now, uh, they're pushing it up, and, and while uh, MacArthur takes forces away from Kruger to give to Eichelberger, now Kruger's got to slog it up uh, the Villa Verde Trail, Belit Pass, and then you get into the Cagayan Valley, and he's got you know less troops than he really needs. And Eichelberger's going to go clear this area, Operation Victor, which really wasn't given go-ahead by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, they come back to MacArthur and said, you, what are you doing? You know, we really didn't give you the clearance for this. And MacArthur said, this was a key to my campaign. I had to clear all these islands out. And basically it was as well, uh, you know, you've got all these troops coming from Europe that are getting ready to go to Japan. Where are you going to base them all? Oh, yeah, down on Cebu, down on all these uh, Visayan islands to get them, you know, a place to stay at that point. Now, at the end of the war, uh, MacArthur's telling both Kruger and Eichelberger, don't press the Japanese. You've got them bottled up. Nobody wants to be that last guy to die in a war. And MacArthur's starting to plan for Operation Olympic. This will be the biggest invasion, uh, next slide, uh, that's ever going to take place. Uh, they're going to go in at Kyushu, Operation Olympic, the Japanese southernmost island. And then uh, they're going to go into uh Honshu, the Tokyo plane for Cornet, that's going to be in late 1945 and early 1946. And this is where you kind of see this hubris uh, coming in. All that uh, basically humility that might have been caused by the tank corregidor MacArthur is on top again. And the Joint Chiefs, as well as Nimitz and the code breakers, are telling them that the Japanese have, have got about 900,000 troops available for Kishu. They've got about uh, 10,000 airplanes. And MacArthur's like, I don't believe it, you know, trusting that instinct. 
and he's all for the invasion. Now, late July, he'll get the word that the atomic bombs are ready, you know, that they're going to use these things, uh, Brigadier General Farrell and then Carl Spaska. And that's when MacArthur starts telling his chief of staff, don't, don't worry so much about that invasion plan. Start get going for the, the occupation of Japan. Now, uh, it's full circle for the MacArthur and the Allies. Uh, they had been thoroughly defeated by the Japanese at the beginning. And then, unlike Kimmel and Short at Pearl Harbor, MacArthur was given the chance to redeem it. Three and a half years, come back, and then you're made Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers. I mean, it's a complete turnaround, complete full circle. And the thing is, is he did this with total support of that team he put together. Those guys were as dedicated as making that show work as MacArthur was. And the thing is, is all of them, all those generals, all those admirals, you know, they may not have gotten along personally with them, uh, but they all believed in them. Uh, Kruger said it best. He said, in war, you've got to have somebody at the top who can make a decision, who can stick to that decision, and he can keep everybody focused on that point, that goal, while everything is just going crazy. And they all know MacArthur is that guy. And so did he. <laughs> now, he goes to Japan, and he proves he's a pretty good statesman. Um, Japan is not paid off. They're not bought off. They have to get back by, by themselves. He'll give them that flat base to be able to build themselves and shows that uh, he was pretty wise in his decisions at that point because he had been in World War One. He'd seen the, the blockade stay on Germany when the occupation started, which just starved out all the Germans and basically just created a whole nation of Nazis. And he didn't want that. He didn't want Jap Japan to have this uh, idea that they needed to seek revenge after this thing was over. And then we know what happens in Korea. He gets fired uh, by Truman. And uh, pretty much end of 52-year career. We look back on it now and we say, well, the guy was pretty smart. The guy was pretty prescient about the world today. I mean, 52-year career. He had a lot of troubles, a lot of failures but a lot of great things that he did. There are seven monuments and statues to MacArthur in seven different countries. And not because he conquered them, but because he helped defend, protect, and liberate them. And there's no other American that can say that. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, James. That was a wonderful, wonderfully, uh high energy, <laughs> amazingly fun lecture. And from there, we learned the island hopping campaigns and how the Pacific War was won. Uh, MacArthur was up against a lot of challenges, an immensely dedicated, immensely driven enemy, a very challenging geography of the Pacific, and um, lack of supplies and men, but he did it. And so uh, we go to the much-awaited question and answer portion. Oh, there was a question there, one question asking which book would be good to read on MacArthur. I recommend this. Ah. <laughs> uh, this was written by James, very easy to read, and uh, after you've read it, you feel like an instant expert on MacArthur. I like right. the coloring book coming out soon. Oh, really? That would be good. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, questions. We've got 60 questions, at least, in the Q&A box. All right. Um, first question goes to Dr. Jose. Uh, this is from Andrew Jones. Good morning from Rhode Island, USA, everyone. My question for Dr. Jose is, in July 1941, when the U.S. embargo on Japan's oil and assets made war with Japan more likely or even inevitable, what options did Quezon have? Well, I think the basic option that he had, and I think he was taking that, was really to place more of the responsibility of the defense of the Philippines on the U.S. Uh, he, he already tried to do that in 1940 uh, because the Philippine government could only pay so much for the defense, its own defense. And that's why I think when the USAFE was created, that fell right in. 
So that fell right into that particular plan. Now, what he did on his own, and uh, this is to his credit, was that since the U.S. was taking care of the military side of the defense, Quezon realized that his own responsibility was to the civil government and to the people. So he put up what was called the Civilian Emergency Administration, which would take care of uh, providing transportation, food, and so forth. Today, this is similar to our what uh, National Disaster Reduction Risk Management thing. Uh, the Civilian Emergency Administration was supposed to function in times of war or catastrophes or typhoons, provide food, transportation, etc. Uh, that's what was put up in 1941. And uh, it was starting to work when the war broke out. So he felt very keenly civilian defense. He saw what Britain had done, he saw what China had done, and he felt since that is that was within the purview of the Commonwealth government, that was what he did. And he did that on, on his own initiative. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jose. Our next question is for James. Uh, this is from Ray Dean Salvosa. Who formulated War Plan Orange? Also, why bring all your forces to Bataan and Corregidor, especially since it was not an ideal place to hold out with no naval and air power Yusufit troops had their back to the sea with no naval forces to take them out. Corregidor, in hindsight, seems like an even worse choice. It could be bombed from both the air and the sea, and once surrounded, the forces there had no choice but to surrender or die fighting. No way out. Uh, Your mic, well, James? The War Department creates War Plan Orange. Uh, this is the, something that the United States have worked on. Uh, do color patterns for different uh, contingencies of who they're going to fight, and Japan is orange. Now, MacArthur uh, believed that as well, and that was why he wanted that defend on the beaches uh, thing. He got War Plan Orange changed right before the war because he felt if they go back to Bataan Corregidor, you're just uh, waiting for defeat. You're just waiting to surrender. And so he had this belief that, like Yamashita wanted to do, that he could have this mobile defense and defend on the beaches. The thing is, is that his troops weren't up to it. You know, they had never had joint operational planning. Or, I mean, they had planning, but not any kind of technical training. And most of these guys were up there had never fired their weapons. And so they're at the right place. But the you know, Japanese are pretty good at what they're doing. And so even after the war started, MacArthur was thinking, you know, I'm going to have to probably go back to War Plan Orange. But he, he still held out and wanted to see how this defend on the beaches thing went. And it went miserably. I mean, the, down when the Japanese land at Legaspi, they, you know, they can't even get down there and, and face it at all. When they land up in the north, uh, it's all these Philippine divisions that are pretty raw. I mean, he doesn't use his 31st or the 4th Marines that he has up there to defend on the, the beaches. He throws the uh, these... Uh, you know, Philippine army units and the 26th cavalry up there, and they can't they can't hold. And so then that's what happens. You go back war plan orange. You're dependent on maybe 40,000 people. You know, you got 100,000 people in there, and you can't feed any of them. And it's just like MacArthur said, you were waiting for a defeat because the the navy was destroyed. And before when they built all these harbor forts, they weren't looking at air power. They were looking at naval power. Those places were meant to defend against a seaborne invasion. As soon as the Japanese realize that they have to bomb from over 20,000 feet, they've got them. You know, they've got them right there. So, Yeah. That answers. Thank you, James. Uh, a follow-up question, Dr. Jose. Um, I read somewhere that the landings in Vigan, Vigan was, an no, we had no troops there, Dr. Jose? Yeah. Uh, the only troops in Vigan, actually, I think there was a constabulary detachment, but it was not an army detachment. Uh, what MacArthur did was, although his plan was to defend the beaches, you know, we have so many kilometers, hundreds of kilometers of beach, so you can't defend all of them. So the most uh, obvious landing point would have been Lingayen Gulf. Mm -hmm. But that's also a large, very large stretch of sand. So Vigan and Apari and Legaspi, these he felt were minor landings that didn't have to be challenged. Unfortunately, the Japanese wanted to take those for the airfields, and once they took the airfields, they could station their planes there. And since MacArthur had no planes, that really kind of sealed the whole thing down. But it's true, the, the beach in Vigan is a very beautiful beach, uh, but yeah. there was hardly any resistance. Right. Dr. Jose, there's a question here from Teodoro Santa Ana. Admiral Nimitz already convinced Roosevelt to go straight to go straight in invading Japan 
which was reasonable and logical. MacArthur thereafter persuaded Roosevelt to pass through the Philippines to honor his promise to return, which he likened to the word of the United States of America. How would ha how could how would probably how would that have changed the course of the war with an earlier victory and peace and spared the damage and destruction of Manila? So we've got a lot of what ifs and could haves in the in the question and answer portion. But uh, yeah, think, could you care to answer? I think uh, Jim answered some of that also earlier. No? But uh, the the main problem was really I think that the U.S. Navy Nimitz was not going to invade Japan directly. They were going to invade first Taiwan. Formosa at that time. Uh, the problem was if you invade Taiwan, you have a very hostile population, no friends at all, and uh, by bypassing the Philippines, you would also uh, you you'd, you'd give up basically the ba potential bases in the Philippines area. So uh, it was not an early defeat for Japan. I don't think it would have. Because remember, if the plan timetable did carry out in October, November 1944. This was long before Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and the fighting would have been extremely severe. So there was no way. The Americans would not have landed in Japan that early. Uh, Iwo Jima was February 1945. Okinawa was April 1945. And the fighting there was extremely horrendous. We can imagine the same thing happening if Taiwan was invaded, because the Taiwanese were mobilized and Japan would have defended Taiwan as if it was their own territory. Yes, yes, agree, yes. Uh, next question is for Jim. Um, how true, I know this question is going to pop up, how true that MacArthur accepted Quezon's offer of honorarium while the Commonwealth government was in exile in Washington, D.C., as alleged in Dwight Eisenhower's biography? Is there truth the, to this, Jim? The $500,000? $500, yeah, I mean, yeah. he gets it. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes from Kazon. Uh, as it's been shown, uh, MacArthur was owed a certain percentage of every peso that goes into the uh, Philippine army. That was part of his contract. It was something like one one-hundredth of every peso that goes into it. So in 1942, that works out to be about 500,000 bucks. Uh, because they had dumped all this money from the sugar excise into the army right at the end. Now, the thing about it, though, is uh, his chief of staff gets money. Uh, you know, R Dick Marshall gets money. All these people that are active duty, you know, uh, army people that had no contract with the Philippines. And so it just stinks uh, because of what it, what it is, you know, when it happens. I mean, uh, it goes before... Franklin Delano Roosevelt, it goes before Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, it goes before Marshall, they all pass off on it because it was in that contract uh, with MacArthur and the Philippine government. But it's just the whole circumstances of it that are just, you know, really pretty horrible. Hmm. All right. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> Ah, another question for you, Jim. Uh, how was General MacArthur's relationship with his older brother, Arthur MacArthur III? Were they at par in terms of their military? But Arthur died of appendicitis, right? In 1923? Yeah, um, uh, they, were, they were very close. I mean, you got to think about it. MacArthur and his brother grow up on these western forts. Uh, I mean, when their kids, Geronimo and the Apaches, are running around right where he is, they are a very tight-knit family. Uh, they, you know, they had this experience that we only know about because of books and, you know, what you've seen in movies. So, yeah, that family, you know, you want to talk about somebody that are close. And uh, the, the, the wild thing is, is you think of MacArthur having all this flowery prose vocabulary like his father Arthur MacArthur did. If you look at uh, his brother Arthur MacArthur III, it's the same thing. It runs throughout the family. Somebody can ask him a question on one page of paper, you're going to get a nine-page answer. You know, <laughs> this, you know, being to come through. So they're they're very much alike. And uh, the thing is, is Arthur MacArthur, from his time in the Naval Academy, he was in a steam. He was in a sail. He's in a diesel. And when he dies, he's getting into naval air power. You could have very well had an Admiral MacArthur and a General MacArthur in World War II if uh, he hadn't died of appendicitis. Yeah, very close. All right. Uh, sad he died early, huh? Uh, to Dr. Jose. Hold on, I can't find a question. Oh, this is from Shusuke Kobayashi. Kobayashi-san, how early did MacArthur start regarding Japan as a prospective enemy? Sir Rico? I think, 
as early as his first stationing here in the Philippines. Because, you know, when he graduated from West Point, he was sent here, first foreign post as an engineer. And he went to uh, he went and watched uh, some of the battles of the Russo-Japanese War, so he he saw that uh, so, so some of the fighting that t- took place there. So I think he already realized quite early that Japan was going to be a potential threat. Of course, by that time it wasn't yet, uh, but after the Russo-Japanese War, when Japan did become a major uh, regional power, I, I think he and and it's after the Russo-Japanese War when the Orange Plan start to be developed and all of that. All right. So, you know, you look, the timing is very interesting because when is Corridor constructed? It's constructed after, almost right after the Russo-Japanese War. The guns are first test fired after the problems with the San Francisco school board, uh, where they excluded the Japanese from the San Francisco schools and created an international mm-hmm. event about 1906. So, mm-hmm. Corridor is built out of that tension. Ah, okay. All right. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jose. Uh, for Jim, there's a lot of questions here about the uh, MacArthur family. Was it a personality or character flaw for both father and son, Arthur Jr. and Douglas, to have, to have blinders or weakness when it comes to dealing with American politicians? Well, Arthur was not uh, in good terms with Taft. Uh, compared to their relationship with the Filipino politicians who revered them. Yeah, I, you know, uh, Arthur MacArthur, uh, when he comes back to the United States after being in the military governor in the Philippines, he should have been chief of staff to the Army. I mean, he was the top lieutenant general in the United States. But who became Secretary of War? William Howard Taft. And so there's no way that Arthur MacArthur was going to get to be chief of staff. And he'll always look at it as, you know, politicians ruined my career. Politicians ruin every army person's career. And Douglas MacArthur is going to take that to heart. And so throughout his life, you know, as soon as, especially after World War I and he gets uh, back and he's working as chief of staff and he's got every politician trying to cut off his head, uh, he's going to think the same thing. You know, all these uh, politicians are just out to get me and uh, it culminates when you get to Korea and he's got to deal with um, President Truman and other people who he feels like these politicians don't know what to do. But that all comes from his dad. You right. Know? He saw exactly what happened to, to uh-huh. his career, and he didn't want, you know, he thought they were going to do the same thing to him. Well, is it true that uh, Arthur, uh, because of, you know, he, he was so uh, mad at the government, he said, he told Mary Pinkney Hardy not to, not to bury him in his uniform? Yeah, he was buried in Milwaukee in, uh, in Mufti, you know, not in uniform. And he was buried right there. The thing is, though, is either the mother wanted to be buried at Arlington Cemetery mm-hmm. or Douglas MacArthur had something to do with it because they dug him up and they buried him at Arlington Cemetery. And that's where he's buried now oh. uh, with his wife, Mary Pinkney Hardy, and Arthur III is buried uh, right, there, right there near him. In Arlington. Yeah. Right. Very nice. All right. Sir Rico. Uh, from Angela Silva, what cooled the relationship between Quezon and MacArthur pre-war when the relationship was supposed to be very close? What was distracting MacArthur or taking his attention away at the time? Yeah. Well, the main, the main thing that I think kind of broke the back of the relationship was when MacArthur was kind of hard to get. Uh, that's why he, he turned to Eisenhower more often, and that's why Eisenhower had an office in, in uh, Malacanang. But uh, I think, yeah, uh, MacArthur was difficult to get. I think Mac- uh, Quezon would actually have to virtually force a meeting with MacArthur and some of the staff, Philippine Army staff, and ask point blank, what are your, what are your plans for Mindanao? And he had no answers for that. Uh, how are you going to support the... Uh, elements in the Visayas. He was not very clear about that. And uh, that's why uh, at this time, Lim and uh, Eisenhower already had, had Quezon's ear. And with what happened in Poland, uh, men on horseback and a, a very, very dedicated loyal army being defeated by tanks, Quezon could foresee that the same thing was going to happen to the Philippines. And MacArthur could not answer 
the his questions in a very satisfactory manner. So uh, apart from the fact that he was a little hard to get. Now, what distracted him? I think his family was uh, something that tended to distract him. He supposed to have been watched movies quite regularly. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, he was hard to get. And when finally Quezon kind of broke up with MacArthur, uh, MacArthur tried to catch Quezon. And at one point, I think MacArthur told Vargas, sometime your boss will want to see me more than I want to see him. And that would happen once he was made commander. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we are running out of time. We have uh, maybe a few questions. We can answer some more questions. Uh, uh, this is for James. It is from Ray Doma. It is alleged that MacArthur, while already aware of Pearl Harbor, did not take action to bring or transfer the available aircraft to safer ground. How true and would such transfer could have helped to hamper Japanese invasion? Well, yeah, most definitely. Uh, the, the thing is, MacArthur and Sutherland would always maintain that they had ordered the bombers down to Mindanao earlier than that. And they'll maintain this all the way through the 50s as they write each other personally you know not to the press or anything Sutherland will say you know we ordered those bombers down there you know to to Mindanao now uh, the thing was was that down at Del Monte you were supposed to have another bomber force coming in which was going to base there and if Brereton had moved all those bombers down there you wouldn't have enough room for everybody and so that was the main problem then on that morning of uh, December 8th the Japanese are very good at what they're doing they dupe the radars everybody goes up about 11.45 they're all running out of gas you bring them all down at the same time then you've got a lot of problems with your fighter control uh, that morning, uh, you know, not knowing exactly where your attack's going, and everybody gets wiped, you know, half of the bomber force gets wiped out there. Uh, So they should have moved it out. MacArthur uh, definitely deserves the blame. He's the top guy in charge. They should have gotten something out, but uh, as far as the destruction of Clark Field, that's more of a tactical thing, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, We don't have much time anymore, but I'd like to read some comments here. Uh, this is from Tracy Ligid. She says, thank you so much for hosting this. I am a friend and fan of the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk. I am a Filipino-American living in Virginia Beach. My mom, who is from Southern Leyte, works at the Memorial Gift Shop one day a week. (laughs) Ah, Thank you so much again for hosting this, and we look forward to more in your series. I'm trying to look for the comment earlier. Uh, She's a fan of Dr. Jose. I can't find it now. (laughs) Anyway, uh, thank you so much to our viewers. We hate to say goodbye, but we have to bring this tonight's episode to a close. We hope we have clearly presented facts and busted myths. And we hope to see you again in the next Intramuros Learning Sessions. Oh, wait, one last question, Jim. I read in your book that the dugout dog, which is a very, you know, uh, famous name for him, was actually just coined by the men from Bataan. The, the men from Corridor did not think of him that way. No, because he was, he was showing up every air raid. You know, all of a sudden he'd pop, out, pop up at some gun turret or something. You know, every, every time the, the bombers came through, that's when he's out walking around. So, no, they don't believe it. And that's the, that's the wild thing. You know, MacArthur was the most decorated officer in World War I for bravery. And here he is at 60, you know, three, 64. Man, I got to prove myself all over again. You know, that's why <laughs> you know, he's landing on every beach, you know, 44, yes. 45, you know. Uh-huh. So there you go. We hope we have busted that myth, the dugout dog myth. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for Thanks spending your weekend. Saturday night with us. Uh, this is Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you don't have any choice because you're locked down at your homes. <laughs> Thank you. And we look forward to the next uh, World War II topic uh, for intramural learning session. Thank you so much, Dr. Ricardo Jose of the UP Department of History, who, uh, who is the foremost World War II historian of the Philippines. It's always a pleasure listening to his lectures. Thank you, Jim, for that high-energy lecture. I know you would put that, you will, we will really do that and uh, amaze our audience. <laughs> thank you so much. Rancho, back to you. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. That was a very lively discussion. Now, for all of those who genuinely want to keep on asking, you can contact our guest moderator for tonight, Ms. Des Benipayo. Her email is desiree.benipayo at gmail.com. So we noticed that there are more than there are still more than a hundred questions 
for this episode. So we can't answer them all. We are really sorry for that. But we are giving you this email in case you are genuinely interested in knowing more about the topic. Now, uh, please support us in the Intermodal Administration. So we are available in uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you came in late, or if you missed this episode, do not worry because this episode is recorded and will be uploaded later in our uh, YouTube channel. So just key in Intramuros Administration in YouTube or go to this link, bit.ly slash IAILS. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. So this episode will be uploaded later. And you can share with your friends this episode later if uh, you... Uh, and then we are also available in Google Arts and Culture, so you can view our museum collection at Google Arts and Culture, just key in Intramuros Administration. Then some announcements. Uh, we are now accepting papers for the second annual Intramuros Young Scholars Conference. So this is open to all who are below 30 before, at the time of the conference this November. 2020, and in order for you to qualify, in order for your paper to qualify, you must have an undergraduate, an original undergraduate thesis on intramuros. So only unpublished research will be accepted. And for more information, you can go to archives.intramuros.gov.ph. And the call for papers that's available in our website at intramuros.gov.ph. The deadline for the submission of papers is on September 28th. Now, Intramuros is also nominated this year for Asia's Leading Tourist Attraction by the, in the World Travel Awards Asian Edition. So help us get this title this year of 2020 Asia's Leading Tourist Attraction by going to worldtravelawards.com, then register for a link, then verify your account, then go to Outstanding Votes and Asia's Leading tourist attraction, vote for Intramuros Philippines. Uh, the Philippines has also been nominated for four other awards. So we've been nominated for Asia's Leading Tourist Board, for the Department of Tourism, Asia's Leading Dive Destination, Asia's Leading Beach, Beach Destination, and Asia's Leading Wedding Destination. So Cebu has been nominated this year as Asia's Leading Wedding Destination. So help the Philippines. Uh, win these awards by going to the website and vote. So that's it for this episode. And thank you, our dear, our dear speakers and our attendees for this very lively discussion. So uh, let's uh, see each other again next time. But for now, uh, good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good yeah. night. Thank you.